Hey everybody, before we get into this week's episode of The Oddest Couple, I have a very big announcement to make. John and I will officially be doing our first ever live show edition of The Oddest Couple podcast here in New York City on Thursday, May 25th at 7.30 p.m. at City Winery in Manhattan. City Winery is an amazing venue for those who live in New York. You've probably been to many shows there. We are super stoked. When we first kind of teased this a couple of weeks ago, the responses were overwhelming. So, of course, we had to make it happen. So, buy your tickets and buy your tickets early. We're going to put the link to be able to buy those tickets in the description of this video. Bring your cousin. Bring your mom. Bring your dad. Bring your boyfriend. Bring your girlfriend. It's going to be a Thursday night. We're going to have drinks. We're going to make this a very interactive experience. We're going to bring people on stage. We're going to do a meet and greet. It's going to be a lot of fun. And for John and I, this can be a very special moment. You know, we're both New Yorkers. So to be able to do our first live show in New York City is very, very exciting. So once again, City Winery, Thursday, May 25th at 7.30 p.m. The tickets will sell out. So buy those right now if you can. And let us know if you're coming. We are super excited to meet all of you, and uh, we just can't wait to to see you all there. So now let's get into this week's episode of The Oddest Couple. There we go. And we're live. Another episode of The Oddest Couple. I'm Felix Levine, and across from me is John A. Light. If you're listening to this right now, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, it's gonna be a uh, it's gonna be a great show. Real quick, if you don't do it already, follow us on Instagram at Felix Levine and at John A. Light at True John A. Light on TikTok at Felix Levine for myself on TikTok. Our YouTube channel, which is on John's channel, actually. Uh, make sure you subscribe to his channel. Uh, turn on the notifications, comment on all the videos, like all the videos, subscribe there. You'll watch everything in their full... Hit the subscribe button. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Buy coffee every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, subscribe there. And I think that's more or less it for the housekeeping. Today, we're going to talk about... I like that shirt. We're talking about my clothes? Yeah, well, no. Did you like I'm, the we're last not talk one about last week, the Robert Grant? I wear a lot of Robert Grant. That's a nice one, though. One, yeah, this one's... Um, sorry, I got distracted. Uh, what we want to talk about this week, which I don't think we've ever talked about weirdly enough, we've talked about different, like, maybe organized crime here in the United States, whether it's, like, some of these different um, gangs here, but how the organized crime is different around the world and how, in your experiences, dealing with the different organized crime groups, let's say, around the world. Um because I think it gives a ton of insight into how things are different for me personally. <laughs> no, I have no experience. But for me personally, <laughs> when I tell people about you and the well, you mafia, travel a lot of Europe. I do travel, but I don't. I don't partake in organized crime in Europe. Nor do I do it here or anywhere. Just to be clear for anybody listening. You mean sometimes you pass messages for <laughs> in Dubai? It, <laughs> My yeah, Arab imagine, connections. Imagine with the sheik. Talk, talk, with the shit. Yeah. They got money there too. Um, but no, you have experiences dealing with them. And what I tell people here about the mafia is that it was always, not that it makes it justifiable or okay, but when you were dealing with people, when you were being violent with people, it was always people, it was always the men involved in the mafia. You sign up for a game, you're part of the game, it's kill or be killed. That's it, right? That's what the mafia was here. Where I kind of lose respect for, I think, a lot of organized crime outside is when they would kill me, uh, women and children, right? And I think that's not to say that killing anybody in general general is honorable, but it's not even – it's disgusting when you bring in women and children that have nothing to do, that don't subscribe to the life. So I'm curious from your experience, I guess off the bat, which country or which region is most similar – in terms of the mafia United States, particularly in the New York area that you were a part of? You know, Europe mentality overall is completely different than the mentality of the New York mafia here. 
And I'll give you an example. You know, they call the Italian mafia in Italy, you know, here in America, they call them Zips. And uh, they didn't like them, didn't really want to respect them here. Uh, when they came here and they got straightened out or made here. And the uh, Italian mafia and the different uh, organizations in Europe and Italy had a completely different mentality than here. And one of the reasons I, I believe is um, here that's so out there. I mean, this is, I'm, the mafia now is 40 years removed from what I was used to. You know, this is the mid of 2025 almost compared to 1980 and the mafia back then. It was completely different. These guys now uh, talk too much, uh, move around in groups and gangs too much, don't really understand the rules and regulations and the, uh, the, the, the violence is nothing compared to when we were, you know, guys were getting killed. But in Europe itself and different mentalities, I think you look at the Albanian, the guys from, and Albania now is spread out through every country whether it's Amsterdam, Germany, because it's a big presence of Albanians, uh, the UK. You look at the way they carry themselves, they work within each other in a, in a quiet way. They're not as boisterous, but I think they're, the violence in Europe is a lot more extreme than it is here now. Here, there's but, no violence. But back in your day, and I guess even still now in some weird ways, like, how do you think the cartels, specifically the Mexican cartels, the Colombian cartels, compared violence-wise to the mob, to the mafia your, in your time period? I mean, the United States mafia, we don't touch families. You know, we don't touch kids. We don't touch women. But the cartels, they do. Uh, they did back then. They will today. Um, look what's going on now through the fentanyl and the, uh, the bringing in of fentanyl and the attack on our kids. Uh, and uh, if the, the force, they're forcing people from these countries to bring it in. And, and it's not really talked about that much. I don't know why. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the drugs are being brought in, fentanyl and different things for the cartel now, are being forced by individuals that are coming across. If you don't bring it in, we're going to kill your family. We're going to attack your family. We're going to, you know, prostitute your kids. We're going to prostitute women. There's, you know, there's trees along the border that they, after they rape women, they, they're putting their garments up on a tree to show the, you know, the intimidation. So nobody really talks about that stuff. And, you know, my country, and we talk about Albania and, the, you know, the Serbian war. And a lot of women and kill, kids were killed in Kosovo by the Serbians. Now, I know they're going to, obviously attack every time I talk like this. And I'm sorry, reality and truth of what happened is what happened. You know, I go to a lot of the cemeteries uh, and when I go to Kosovo and I, and I just was here in the city at the Serbian uh, uh, consulates, you know, in protest of some of the things that happened. Now, everybody has the ability to, to say what they want and what's true, what they believe is true. And these are my facts and what I believe is true. And that's why I'm a big advocate of, of what you just said. You don't kill kids. You don't touch women. And, and no different in the mob. Uh, you just don't do it. And it happens in other countries. When you were working actively in the mafia, I know you guys frequently worked with the cartels. I have good friends that were involved with the cartels. Uh, when I was on the run, they helped me in, to move over to Colombia and then moving over to Venezuela and army base. So yeah. But what about when you were, when you were actively in the mob, drug probably mostly drugs. Would you? How does like a broker deal go with like a let's say a Mexican cartel? How does that work when you're an active mafia member? At your I don't position? think a lot of these guys had connections like that around the world. Most of these mob guys never left the country, but I did. My girlfriend at the time, Lorraine, her brother was uh, my connection in, in uh, Colombia. So I would get my, my coke from him. Uh, his father so how did was, that work? 
as far as getting yes yeah, so connection. you would call him i would just go well I'd, I'd be at his house because i was dating the sister and uh how's the conversation go conversation was get me 40 keys and he would go get me 40 keys seriously just as simple as that he would have his father was killed actually by the cartel and, and the son was forced henry was forced in the business it wasn't that he was involved he was paying his father's debt off so how did okay so then how did it work with that so you say henry i need 40 keys and he would bring me 40 so, keys so then he would he later. would call his people and that are bringing like how's that they would i would i don't know how other people did it i got it directly in mine was right off union turnpike by st john's university i would pick it up right at his house so a lot of these guys are getting it from uh, they'd get it from Miami or they'd have to travel and make arrangements or pick it up themselves depending on the price. I was having it hand delivered right to his house and I'd pick it up right there. So I had a different connection though. I had a direct connection. So who who was the person? Do you know who the people that brought it were? Are they direct cartel members? Oh, direct cartel members. They were, they were bringing so it in. It was Mexican or Colombian? They were Colombian. So it'd be like Colombian guys. They would come, they would drop it off. Did you have to pay a certain amount of money up front? And then half when they showed? Uh, not really, but I did. I I I would give him cash when I seen him when I pick up the four. So like, how much was? But 40? I would take if I needed ten on arm, he would give it to me, and I just replaced it. What would be? What would be? How much would forty be? Back in those days, uh, you know, the price varied. At, at the beginning, it was in in the forties, and later on, it it came down for to the thirties for a kid, yeah. And then it went down to like twenty eight to thirty one. So forty. Well, let's see. Hold on. So if I get, wouldn't pay forty though. That wasn't my price. That was street prices. Oh. So, you know, the street price, you get, you could sell a key back then for 40 something thousand. And so you're getting it how much, though? Uh, when I was getting it at, at direct at some parts, the 22,000, 26,000. So let's see, 22,000. What was the standard? How much would you usually order at a time? 40? No, it depends. Some some weeks I'd just pick up 10 a week. Sometimes I'd just. So that's I'd like, you're for, still looking at, you got up front a couple hundred thousand. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're and you're and you're bringing them cash, cash. Yeah. So you would bring, so they would tell you like a a time, a spot, off Union Turnpike. No, I just go to his house, oh. pick it up. I told a story once a while ago. It was one of my friends, Joey. We went to the house. The mother didn't speak English. She told me downstairs it used to be under the stairwell, and she thought I was only picking up two or three at the time, and it was I think forty seven or forty eight keys. And my friend said it's heavy. Yeah, and, and I wasn't supposed to come over. I just happened to stop over, and my friend was looking to kill the mother. Wow. And I looked at him. I said, "You out of your mind talking to me like that?" You know. So that, and he wasn't really that kind of guy. But yet, when it came to that kind of money, that all of a sudden he was that. Well, kind yeah, because you're looking at what fifty times. Tw you're looking yeah, well, at you're a couple looking million at dollars. a couple million easy, and right. you know, yeah, and you know, and I told the mother after that, and I told the daughter, the girl I was dating. You gotta tell your mother you can't let nobody down here like this they'll take a life yeah for this kind of you know and she didn't realize she thought i was the one that was picking it up somebody else was coming to get that i was only coming i was short a couple of keys at the time i just ran over to get it did you ever when you were active not when you're on the run go to colombia or mexico uh i went to mexico all the time in mexico we were moving more uh marijuana out of uh, oh. mexico in those days not co well, you, you, you'd bring if you're going over you would bring you'd bring back with another five or ten and how would you keys. bring it back trucks so and we you'd had pay off the border guys they were already paid off that had to do with the guys we were picking up from they had those guys so paid. like how much would you so you'd go i wouldn't deal with them direct i didn't have to our guys would have their border guys they bring the truck on the texas side for us and uh we take it from there so. Would you ever would so you would physically like be in the truck? No, no, never, no. You'd always. We had crews that would do it, yeah. Because you can't be caught in worst case. No, nah, you wouldn't do it. You know, what are guys calling the shots? I'm the guys bringing it in. Right? So I had, I wouldn't go near that stuff. But when you would so, when you would go to Mexico. Where were you meeting? Were you meeting with cartel members directly? Yeah, like, why would of, you go? Why why couldn't you just call somebody or have somebody do it? You didn't, we didn't use the phones, even especially back then. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was no big deal. We were always traveling back and forth to Mexico. So we'd meet, we'd talk, uh, you know, we'd tell them we're coming down for vacation. I'd see a couple of guys. I'd make a meeting. Later on, I had my cousin Billy, who uh, 
would have connections to also with his guys. And so, you know, they'd bring it across and, uh, you know, so I wouldn't have any, I would coordinate, I would talk about how much we're bringing, but that's about it. And at a meeting, it would be with like leader, more of the like cartel guys, whoever was organizing it? Whoever was organizing or whoever connections were. And, you know, so, over the years, that changes, depends on who was. So you'd sit down, you guys would just get like whatever, co like drinks, coffee, sit down, talk, talk business? Well, we, we we wouldn't have coffee. We'd have we would drink tequila. We drink. We'd have girls but around. That? Would be good, you know. Right, it, was, right. it was. Listen, Does it, it look was a couple did, days of party? Did it look now. like the movies? Yeah, I mean, listen, like narco. You see narcos? Yeah, just, yeah, and and a hundred percent. Yes. Really? Yeah, we had groups, and I want you know we we'd go down. It was probably. Uh, uh, 15 or 20 of us on an occasion. And we the, the minute we got there, they met me at a hotel and it wasn't supposed to start off this way and, and then it did. We're all drinking shots, we're drinking crazy and we drank all night and you know, we're having a good time. And you know, listen, these guys are regular guys to me too. You know, it's just, uh, it's money and uh, you know, you're not thinking about anything else but making money. It ain't the violence, you know, you're trying to avoid the violence. And between us, because we were friendly, there was no violence. Everything actually worked out. But there was a time when one of my friends went down there without me and got locked up down there, uh, Mark Ryder's son, Greg, who later on ends up uh, disappearing, he gets killed. So there were some of my friends that ends up, end up screwing the cartel and getting killed for it. Uh, How do you screw them? Uh, well, one guy, took kilos off him, they chopped his head off, and they left his head in Florida, at the time on a post on the intercoastal. So, you know, when guys do dumb things, dumb things happen. And with Henry's father, Henry's father got robbed, he didn't rob them. Uh, but I guess they didn't trust him, they ended up killing him, so. And again, you're going back in the and 80s. Like you're going back in the 80s when guys are getting killed left and right, it was a different era. So, you know, when you are dealing with that kind of money, and there's any kind of, uh, you get, you're gonna get killed. Wait, would it, cause I remember like the, the scenes in Narcos when, you know, you, you, I guess you get brought to like a certain house and then there's armed guards all around. Is that actually how it is? Or there's not as many, there's maybe a couple, like what is that? Do they, they pat you down? You're not allowed to come in with? We went on an occasion and they had to have, they came to pick us up. They picked me up at the airport. This is where? In Mexico. Where and, in Mexico? And uh, near Puerto Vallarta. Okay. You know, so we went down to vacation and do business. And they came to pick me up. And they must have came with, I don't know, seven, eight cars. A lot of them. And this is the thing that people don't understand. that. And Garcia Luna has just got arrested from the head of the FBI in Mexico. I spoke about it. You know, we had a lot of federales that would meet us. They're the gangsters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there's, you know, seven, eight, ten, who knows how many cars, I don't remember, but they're all machine gunned up, gunned up. Yeah. They're all hanging out with us, and, and it's a different, yeah. you know, it's a completely different setup in these countries. It was no different when I went on the run and I'm in Colombia. You know, they bring me across to Venezuela, and, you know, there's checkpoints everywhere you go. I don't get out of the car. They tell me to sit in the car, and they talk to where they talk. They give them a couple bucks, Tell them whatever names they're throwing at each other. I don't know. And they, they brought me into a Venezuelan army base, and I stayed there for a while. You know, and, I, and if I don't leave, I'm safe there. But, you know, I moved around. I should have just stayed there back in those days when I was running. But, you know, these, you know, this is like anything else. It's run like a corporation, like a business. It's, it's run, the, you know, the wheels are oiled well, and it just runs like clockwork. Unless somebody does something wrong, and that's when the violence comes in. Did you ever feel like what do you feel like when you walk into uh, you have like these guards that bring you to a house, and there's more guards, and you know that like like is there any kind of nerves? No, because they're your friends, and you're not. There's no it, unless you're doing something wrong, you'd be nervous. You you know you're not trying to rob them, you're not right. trying to beat them, you're not you're not doing you're doing straight business with them. They're not trying to kill anybody unless you're doing something wrong. That yeah, of course that's going to happen. That happens in the mob world. That happens in the cartel world. But you never did you ever get into any sticky situation with the cartels? Never. The only one that did was my friend when yeah. uh, 
They were in a house, like you said. They were waiting for a shipment. And instead, oh, somebody was an informant, and the uh, Federals showed up, oh. which who knows who, which one yeah. of them. Later on, I find out which one of them. And uh, they lock them up. And my friend calls me from a Mexican prison uh, and tells me he's in jail there. And I warned him. I says, don't go do that deal. You don't know all the players. You're, you're doing a deal. That's, and he wanted to do the deal. He did it. What and, was the deal? Uh, coke and, 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 and pot. But what, you know? why did you say that you shouldn't have done the because deal? Because you're doing, it's not, you know, and his answer was, you don't need it. I do. You know, in other words, this is my time to try to make money. So he was doing business with guys that he shouldn't have been doing business with from America, that he was trusting them with their connections down there. And I told him not to do that. Hmm. You don't do you don't do a deal like that with people you really don't know like that. I'm dealing directly with my guys and my friends that I have trust value with. So uh, it's too dangerous because of a lot of reasons. They'll rob you, kill you, or set you up like they did. Interesting. But the 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 international effect of doing business is if you're like Klaus, right, was in jail with me in Brazil. He's the main guy of Denmark mm -hmm. with hashish and other things, but he's the guy. So that's my partner over the years. We just did the four part series. Actually, it's, it's streaming on Rocco now. Um, we're going to do a second four parts to that. But He's my main guy, right? And his guy that he hooks me up from California back in the, in the 90s. So I'm dealing directly with the guys. If you go to UK, I'm good friends with Patrick Jenkins. Everybody knows the time with me in the United States. If we talk about Canada, I have Lee Whitley. When the Travel Magazine did, I did the GQ centerfold for about the mafia with a guy named Alex that did that. Later on, he does a travel magazine and he asks me, can you get me some connections to other countries? And I says, yeah. And I said, hold on. And he left. He goes, now? I said, you just asked me. So I started calling countries that he wanted to talk to guys mm. to do a, a, a thing about exactly what you're talking about. So you, when you go to Albania, I have friends there. You go to Kosovo, I have friends there. If you go to Macedonia, I have friends there. If you go to Amsterdam, I have friends there. Greece, I have who was... The, one of the bosses there, uh, the UK, you have Patrick, and I have uh, different guys there that, you know, now I talk regularly with Marvin Herbert. The guys know who he is. Um, Brian Attacks, man, I've talked to, who's, you know, a big tough guy in his day. Uh, so, you know, you, you develop international friendships because you're traveling internationally. So you, you're going from country to country knowing the guys that are, you know, maybe not the boss, but close to it, or some of the bosses that are my friends. And uh, you talk about El Salvador, my friend Nelson, who I still actually is out of the life and I still speak to. So these are guys that were the, the bosses of these organizations. Other than the Mexican cartels, did you ever go to Colombia? Well, I lived in Barranquilla. I lived in. But Santa that was when Monta, you're on the run, Cartagena, right? When I was on the run. But during the mob times, the only place you would really. Go I traveled. Was... I always traveled all, all over Europe. But like in terms uh, of act, no, in terms of actual I, business in like South America with the cartels, it was only the Mexican cartels that you would travel to when you're in the mob. Yeah, I never uh, traveled to Colombia. Uh, I traveled everywhere else. I used to travel to Puerto Rico a lot. I did business through there. Uh, back in those days, I was. Did you I actually Escobar? stayed in. in no, but the guy I'm talking about, Nelson, his father and uncle were the generals in Salvador who were going to hit Escobar. And there's a book out on it, and they talk about it. And his life story, and he, he's going to be active shortly in, in the movie business and some of the things that he will have him on. You ever meet El Chapo? No, but again, the Flores Damn. brothers are my friends that one of the brothers did, times, did time with me and actually ends up testifying against El Chapo. El Chapo's organization uh, hit his uh, grandfather and father. Oh. And then the brothers were in between a war between both factions. How do you think these guys, like, from your opinion as an insider, a former insider, how do you think uh, guys like El Chapo and Escobar got to the level that they got to? You know, a, a lot of it's like anything else. You know, it's the unknown in our organization to their organization 
it seems it's fascinating, right? Because people don't know about it. No different than they know about the mafia. So to them, they're fascinated with the mafia and the structure. So they're no different than our organization, the way they organize. And there's no different with the corruption with every, listen, every organization, every government has corruption. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like, and I've talked about this several times because I'm always bringing up Oscar Lugo on the show that he was indicted and charged in Westchester, PA. And people ask me, well, he was charged, and I'm saying, here, the problem with the system is you have 53 politicians in, in Philadelphia that were charged with criminal acts. So when they talk about these countries and the third world countries, imagine the corruption there if we have such corruption here. Yeah, but like my, what I'm curious about is how how does somebody like, and obviously I guess there's the answers that people will give you, but it, for in your opinion, how does a guy like Pablo Escobar become Pablo Escobar? Like anything else, any organization, you work your way up. And you become more powerful. Yeah, he didn't these just guys start did it when they were fairly, but they were young, like relatively young when they were at, at their, in their prime. Even Chapo. Yeah, these guys are young, but you're talking like they're like their forties, early forties. Yeah, but so was Gotti. Oh right. You know, it, it, that, people how old are under the he impression was like when he became boss. Uh, let's see, he gets out in about 1978. So you know, he's a fairly young guy. You know, he's. He took over when they killed Paul in '85. Um, I don't know. He was he was young, you know, in, in his late '30s, early '40s. So he was he, he was a pretty young guy. You know, he wasn't you know what people think. You know, they have an image of them because you see them. Right, right, right. You know, and they appear to be older and they act. They a appear little to be older, older and bigger, but like and, guys and, like El Chapo, are like fucking five. How like, like yeah. five seven? It's like Napoleon. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like. I mean, I don't know where El Chapo came from that he originally got his, you know, where he he elevates to that position that fast. I, I don't really know the history of of uh, their organization like that. You know, uh, El Chapo's 5'6". Pablo Escobar was 5'6". That's yeah. how, old, how big is Napoleon? I think Napoleon Man, I destroyed these guys in basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I got a couple inches off. <laughs> Napoleon was 5'6". Yeah, they're all. Caesar. How tall is Caesar? Julius Caesar. Yo, this is wild. Three, the three that I thought of, all were all are five six. I didn't even. I honest to God didn't know that. How big was Caesar? Julius Caesar height. <laughs> five foot seven and a half. Oh, he's getting tall. He's getting <laughs> They're catching up to me. I got a little. They always make me sound like I'm smaller. Aren't you, aren't than you five six? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm five foot eight with heels. <laughs> Wait, that's insane. Yeah. That both Escobar and Chapo and Napoleon all five six. Things you learn on the Oddest Couple podcast. Mussolini, what was it? Mussolini. Oh, 5'7". That little bastard it's deserved these, what he got. You know, yeah. It's these, it's... They dragged him Hitler was 5'9". Not, not that big either. Okay, this is a good guy, though. Churchill was 5'6". Was Churchill 5'6"? His cigar was 5'6". Yeah, his cigar. <laughs> <laughs> Vladimir Lenin was 5'5". Five, five. I think Putin's like 5'8". Max, he might even be shorter. Vladimir Putin height. This is crazy. I'm having fun with this. Oh, see, they don't want to put that. They don't they put that on the internet. Height? It's like it's like not. It's not coming up the way it was for the others. Vladimir, I'm reading an article from the week. Vladimir Putin in the rise of the short kings, at an estimated five foot seven. See, that's because Putin doesn't want to. He doesn't want to show the world estimated that. five seven. That he's five six. Yeah. It's yeah, like the one they put yeah. on football cards. You know, they always give them an extra couple of pounds. And yeah, stuff. or for people that are on dating apps, they yeah. do that as well. Um, this is interesting. It's all these short, insecure dudes that are running that. There you go. There you have it. That's where you How get tall the was Gotti? Uh, Gotti's about 5'10", 5 5'9". 10, 5 5 10. John Gotti, senior height. This is fun. 5'10". Yeah. You know, I'm going to who is 5'5", five five, mob-related? Five five, Nicky Carrazzo. No, a little bit bigger than, like, more famous than him. More famous than him? Uh, that is somebody that wait, you kind of. No, you kind of. I don't want to say beef, but. That I had a beef. Nah, that these days, whatever you just. Who who is it? Starts with an S. Ends with an Ami. <laughs> starts with a G's. Ends with a Ravano. Oh, Sammy Insecure Gravano. <laughs> He's 5'5". Five five. Oh, I know. 
Five five in education in first grade. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> I'll destroy. Him. Forget about forget about beat him up or anything. I'll, I'll destroy him in password. <laughs> we got to play one of those games like on TV. <laughs> the Bryce is right. He's, he's too stupid to name the Bryce. At, how how tall do you think uh, Lucky Luciano was? Lucky, I think was a big guy. I think he was about five nine. Five ten. Yeah. How tall do you think Al Capone was? You ever meet Al Capone? Uh, no. See before your time? Yeah, yeah. Al Capone. I think I, I don't think Al Capone was that short either. What about Vito? Who Vito? Genovese. Oh no, my father grew up with him. He was from the. How tall? He, how tall do you think? I think he was about six foot. Vito. No, smaller. How tall was he? Five seven. Really? That's all he was. Yeah. Yeah, he grew up downtown Riverton, Delancey down there. Five. Do you know? Actually, my Meyer uncle. Lansky? My uncle slapped his sister, not knowing it was his sister. And they chased him out to Detroit, and he wanted to kill him. Why are all these mobsters so short? Where are the six footers? Good thing y'all didn't play basketball. Bugsy Holy Siegel. fuck! Oh yeah, six wait, one, I just saw I think. Bugsy Siegel. Nope, five ten. Really? Just maybe, have, for, maybe according to maybe next to you, he feels like six foot one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm five eight. I'm slightly under five. Wait, eight. this is crazy. But I go why? on my toes a little bit. Why? <laughs> why are they? Uh, why are they all short? Who was Rocky Marciano? Forget the rest of them. Rocky <laughs> Marciano. I think Rocky Marciano was 5'10". Let's see. 5'10". I'm going to tell you why. So, so you know. This is interesting. I'm going to tell you yeah. why. Because most Italian guys are smaller. Not, oh, that's true. It's not a big culture, you know. So if you take like German and that's guys, true. And, the, all and the Latino, and the Hispanic, you know, like the Escobar and shot like yeah, they're, they're not, small. yeah, they're, they're small not big, they're not, it's small, not a big now, culture. Now go to Germany, everybody's going to be 6'2", six, 6'3". Two, six, six, two square So face. really Hitler was pretty small. Five, well, yeah, insecure fucking No, he was an insecure prick. whack job. Yeah, one of the worst Just for the mustache, you want to kill him. Yeah, one of the worst. <laughs> I hate one. that mustache. I hate him. But you know what's crazy is you talk about killing and murder and kids and women. How does how do people so weak to follow that? I know. Right? Well, that's what I'm always curious about. Is like you have these small, literally, and not to bring it back to it, but it's like small men, right? That are able to create such a a level of power and loyalty it, from a, a mass. It, it's not loyalty. It's it's power out of weakness because people are weak. They're so weak. Well, Listen, they're able to tap into something. Even Putin, right? You know, like you have like you have these like these these people that have levels of power that we can't even imagine when you're talking about, you know, Pablo and Chapo and Putin and Hitler and right and all these people, like they were able to get people to follow their mission, so many people to follow their mission. Like any day of the week, somebody could have turned around and killed them. Well, what do you think our CIA does? They go to other countries and they're doing it here now. And they propaganda and they know how to maneuver psychologically to take over or try to take over a country and step back. It's such Machiavelli. That's why he says such gangster moves because I see it because we know. You know, what's one thing Gotti would teach you as a kid? You'd watch him, you'd watch him. I, I would smile the way he would abuse these guys and how weak they were. they really weak. I mean, think about it. Like, if you know, if you're John Gotti and you're intimidating all these guys, how hard is it? To just say fuck this guy, and you know, when the next time yeah. he's there, you just shoot him. But yet they don't do it. You know, they're so scared to do I it. I agree. I'm not just talking about him. But that's why it always I'm blew my mind. Hitler. Like how many guys that's were next I'm to saying. Hitler? Like saying to him, "Listen, I ain't killing no kid." So you know, but they, you know, yeah, I know. It, it, it's crazy to me. So weak that they, or poison them or something. Just something so it doesn't even sound like it look like it's you. How hard is it to do that? It's not, it's I know, not. but that's for. But it was a. In that sense, it's such a level of like, they were treated like gods. They were treated like gods. Well, that's why you see so many people like in schools and how kids are intimidated because they want to be part of the main group. But if there's only a couple, yeah. there's only a couple of strong people that'll stand alone and they'll go against the main group, right? They're so weak, they can't do it. They don't feel secure to stay by themselves. They can't take it if there's so many people against them. They're not able to be that outsider. And there's nothing wrong with being that outside. That's one of the things you got to teach kids now, I think. When they're talking about school, and I said, some of the things they should be teaching in school should be, they should start early about, you know, with psychology and, mm -hmm. and, and I agree with mental that, toughness. And this, it should be a class because it's important through mm -hmm. life to help you to have confidence, right? Without confidence, I really you don't agree have with anything. That. 
they should they should have really they should, that would be such a cool thing to implement like when i have kids one day if i knew that they had you know starting from a young age more open conversations about any and i guess it's it is a little bit advanced if you're talking about like a 7 10 even 12 year old but talking just about like what like maybe this sounds kind of like corny but like talk about what you're feeling or thinking right and then people go around and, the, and then these kids will realize like oh like i'm thinking this this is why i'm thinking that and and like how how does a leader come about how does a follower come about why do people do certain things they should have a class called mental strength right like something like that right and because i think that would be interesting too i think a lot of yeah there would be a lot of things that would be beneficial that would come from that and i think it would better and allow people to understand when they're then in history class two periods later right a couple hours later they would better understand when they're learning about Hitler or about these these different you know historical figures that did horrible things. They would under they would maybe have a better idea of how this psychology and how it happened. You know, it's only eighty years ago. About I know it's fucking crazy. When and you think how about do, it. Well, this is what I don't understand. How do you allow people at this right now, after it was only eighty years ago, not to question things? The biggest thing I think that I want my grandson to understand, or anybody should want their kids is to question every single thing if you don't that's why i don't like that there is not a lot of rhetoric and, and debates because if you don't question anything right if there's if you're you're the way you stand on anything the way an orange tastes right and you're talking about way you know because i'm going to watch what i say because i'm going to talk about uh, I'm not going to talk about science and medical stuff that I'm disagreement of. Thank because God. those two things that we know what I'm talking about, how does everybody just like sheep accept it? Because if I told you okay, to drink this counter- and I don't tell you what's can in there. Can I make that? a counter argument? Yeah. The only thing that I agree, I'm all for, I mean, you you know this at this point. I'm all for open discussion, disagreements, getting a Republican and Democrat in a room Having them debate something, and at the end of the day, and, and then afterwards they go for pizza, they give a big hug, and they go to the movies together because they're best friends. I think that's awesome, right? That's what I hope. I wish this world would look like a lot more. The only thing that I think is a little bit dangerous if you go to the ex- I'm not saying you're going to you're you're saying that you want this extreme, but if everybody only ever questions and doubts every single thing ever, this is how you get. I'm not saying believe things when you hear them. I think you should initially question something. And then once you do your proper research and you get to the, to the point, good, you've done, you've done your due diligence. But the issue now that's being created, in my opinion, is that nobody trusts nothing, which is, I agree, part of the media's fault, part of the politician's fault, both sides. But the issue now is that like, fucking everything is all over the place nobody nobody believe, takes anything as a fact everything is fact or fiction depending on where you stand on certain things and now nobody like this is for me the issue with the politics and what's going on today is like now <laughs> you have democrats and republicans that stand stare and look at the same sky and they can't agree whether it's pink or purple well i'm gonna or tell blue. you why i'll tell you why and you're gonna laugh and you're gonna maybe but people that know what i'm saying aren't gonna laugh we don't really live in a free democratic society that they push. You know why? We only have two, either Democrat or Republican. We don't have a third party running. Yeah. And it's built so they cannot allow a third party to that, run. That I actually 100% agree with. If you let a third party in, I know. this is gonna change. And, but, and it's funny, you know, I think even if a third party was truly let in, right? Not like some libertarian. Yeah, right. Like, if it, then I think but the Democrat, I would actually bring the Democrats and the Republicans together. together. They'd be like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, because they want to own the, Yeah, exactly. They want to own They'd be like, power. wait, 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 we got to get this, this. This is a big problem. I think in, but you know what? I think in 100 years, I think there could be. I hope so. You know, I think there really could be. But I want to tell you about back in my medical. I got to get back to it. Uh-oh. When you have scientists and doctors, they should be able to get on the stage and, and talk. Oh, and say like what they agree with. They, I don't like. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just want to. I'm going to tell you why I don't I like just, him. I just wanted to. I got to show wrong. you how he. He said he was. A, he was a scholarship off. basketball player at five foot two. Who was he playing? The Munchkins from from Wizard of Oz. But he went to throw a ball. Right now, you're an athlete. You're an athlete. Basketball or baseball? He went to throw to... a baseball on a baseball oh. field, and he threw it over there like my. Listen, my grandson can throw, so I can't use him. He threw it like a one year old would throw it that way. Not that way. And if you're athletic and you're playing basketball, oh, there's no way this. you can't toss a ball. 
So he's such a liar. There's name. anything I else I can trust I this guy with? I shouldn't have brought he's up. A complete liar. I can't stand him. <laughs> Fuck. I, I can't wait. Listen, political. there's one thing I like to see get indicted against him for his lies. But anyway, <laughs> no, we don't make it political. <laughs> I almost, I almost. You ever watch Honeymooners, Jackie Gleason? No. I got a big mouth. He he doesn't shut up. He hasn't missed an opportunity to go on the news. <laughs> a journalist, not one magazine. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, this is all my fault. So I shouldn't have brought. I up. want, I want more freedom of election by having the third party. How do we even get there? Oh, basically talking about these these cartel figures that see you. Always, we always get to something political. Fucking shit. You're it's good at your. You've been get. You've been getting good at this at, at, at luring me in. But then I'm also an idiot. I can't be like setting you off with like Fauci and stuff. Yeah, you talking. started. It. I did start. You threw my key word in. I know. <laughs> Fauci. My, the, Fauci. Slowly I turned. Fauci, COVID. Uh, I didn't say it. <laughs> See? I did not say it. Oh my God. It's too I funny. To it. But I'm talking about the international. So listen, if you tr and you travel a lot internationally. I do. So you understand mentalities of different countries. Mm -hmm. Like I think about, you know, you, you, I said UK. I talk about Liverpool. Liverpool, I, they did a mag. I was in a magazine there, you know, a couple of years back, and uh, you know the, the the people are strong people. I'm fighting wise. I'm talking about with their hands, you know. It's a it's a rough community. It is, you know, and uh, I y y I can recognize and understand them because they're passionate. So when you go to each culture, you understand the way they are. The laid back communities, the the other thing, but you understand the mentality of Europe. It's completely. I got to tell you, it's a lot different. Than the states, and I think the people that never really travel, I don't think they understand it. I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's why I think it's important to, tr to travel, and I think that's why it's interesting. We, t I mean, we always joke about how dumb a lot of these mob guys are, is because they never traveled. Like when we were, we were just joking about it off air, it's like after thirty five years, they're still going to either the Poconos or Florida, depending I think on. They the just took a big vacation <laughs> with the Poconos, and they get lost. <laughs> they go. They start taking buses now. <laughs> they can't go. They fight the whole way with their family. Let's just take a bus. It's easier. <laughs> you go up Route eighty, you stupid bastard. <laughs> they don't even get it. Oh, it's I, too I, good. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going? I'm going to Florida. No shit. <laughs> Big vacation again. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, another another fun time on the Oddest Couple podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Um, if you are listening to this, thank you for getting this far. Um, we'll keep <laughs> dropping all our episodes here on wherever you're getting your podcast, whether it's Apple, Spotify, etc. When are so we doing subscribe. the next podcast in, in Dubai? I, Aren't we going to Dubai? You got to get your ass on a flight. I'm going. I you don't like flying. Going. I fly everywhere though. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I like flying. Yeah, it takes you a while because they yeah. stop you. <laughs> well, Dubai because my we got a lot of friends there. So That's true. Gotta, yeah, we got to go to Dubai. Dennis is there. Everybody's there. Everybody's there. Um, if you're watching this, subscribe, like, comment. Did you enjoy this? Did you not? All that good stuff. Uh, follow us on Instagram. For me, it's at Felix.Levine. For John, it's at John A. Light. And uh, we will see you very, very soon.